Good evening, everyone. There was a hush, so I thought an appropriate moment for us to start. Um, welcome to the RCN. Welcome to Nursing Beyond Borders, a history of international nursing. My name is Harold Cassin. Uh, I am the Chief Executive Officer of the International Council of uh, Nurses. For those of you who don't know, ICN is the body recognised internationally by WHO to speak on behalf of uh, the nursing profession globally. Uh, we have more than 130 national nursing associations uh, that are members of ICN and I'm very pleased to say that the Royal College is one of those, uh, one of those members. There are about 29 million nurses uh, right away around the world. So it's my very great privilege and honour to be asked to chair tonight's event, which is, of course, very, very close to the heart of those of us uh, at ICN as well. And I should declare an interest that I spent uh, a lot of my time in this building uh, working for RCN before I went to ICN back in 2016 now. One of my first memories of this room uh, was uh, singing Christmas carols at Christmas. I don't know if they still do that now. Yeah, I don't they do. Do they? Do they? Do they? Do they? Do they? Yeah. Marvellous, marvellous. Um, so, um, this evening's event uh, has been made possible by the RCN uh, Foundation and a bequest from Mary Abbott, uh, a nurse who at one point in time work for WHO, so on behalf of all of us, I'd also like thanks to, to the Foundation to say a few words uh, in, a, in a moment, and to the staff in the library, Sarah and Sophie, who have done the hard work uh, to, make, uh, to make this possible for us. I have to say a few housekeeping rules. There are no planned fire alarm tests, <laughs> so if the alarm does sound, please exit the building through that way. Um, uh, the muster point is just inside Cavendish Square uh, and the bathroom to out to the uh, out to the left, out to the left. Um, I just wanted to share just a couple of thoughts with you before uh, we start with uh, starting here from our speakers and about the uh, about the archive. Um, international recruitment is a topic which is in the headlines at the moment. Um, there has been a noticeable, significant upsurge in international recruitment activity right the way around the world in recent, uh, in recent years. You're interested in any of the detail of that, we've got reports from ICM which are free to download on our website. Driven by shortages, um, mainly in a small number of high income countries at the moment, um, but there are, right the way around the world, very significant, very significant shortages. And, and people often think that, oh, well, this is a, it's a new issue. Um, but it's not. Nursing has been international, has been global right from its very uh, inception. The, the women who established the International Council of Nurses was led by a woman called Ethel Fenwick, uh, who was a UK, uh, was a UK nurse. Um, at, she worked in the UK at the time that when you got married, uh, nurses could no longer continue to be a nurse. And she turned her attention to uh, campaigning and she did an awful lot of things, including establishing the ICM. But what was always very interesting when you look at her history, that her recognition of the importance of collaboration, cooperation, sharing and learning globally, but also the advancement of the nursing profession intimately connected with the advancement of women's rights and addressing gender and discrimination issues. She was very closely involved with the International Women's Society when she set up the International Council of, uh, of, of, of Nurses. Um, the other striking theme for me in relation to the last few years that I've had at ICN uh, has been how nurses are always also at the forefront, not just in terms of 
the contributions they make to healthcare systems in many other countries, but at times of disaster and at times of conflict as well. How nurses who may be working in a country come together with nurses who are working from humanitarian aid and development organisations. We're going to hear a little about MSF and ICRC this evening as, uh, as well. Uh, and are at the forefront of the response to conflicts, to disasters, um, every time putting themselves at great personal danger and risk. And not just dealing with health issues, but all of the humanitarian problems and challenges that then arise um, from those situations as well. Just in the last week, it's just over a week now since the conflict started in Sudan, and I've had a couple of conversations with the um, with the nurse with the nurse leaders uh, in uh, in Sudan, uh, and the situation uh, that they are facing. It's difficult to it's difficult to imagine. It's very similar when we were. And still are in contact with the nurses in Ukraine as well. When you were talking to the nurses, and they said, well, "Just hold fire a moment because there's an air, air raid siren going off, and we've had a problem. We've got to to move." Health facilities coming under attack, literally under attack. No medical equipment and supplies. Food running out. Basic infrastructure falling down. Nurses and other healthcare staff, as we all would be. You know, concerned and worried about your personal safety and that of your families, but remaining at the forefront of providing health care as well. Um, and we talk lots, don't we, and rightly so, about, about the care and the compassion of the profession, but in those moments to see the very real courage uh, is, uh, is phenomenal, is phenomenal. And we're going to, I know, hear a little bit about that this evening. Um, has <coughs> um, enough from me. Let me now ask Deepa to say a few words on behalf of the foundation. Thank you. Shall I walk in? Thank you. Thank you, Howard, uh, for that introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, and to this excellent um, event organised by the wonderful RCN Libraries and Archive Service, who we've worked with at the Foundation over a number of years, um, and I'll come back to that. My name, as Howard said, is Deepa Career, and I'm the director of the RCN Foundation. I'm really pleased that the Foundation's been able to fund this new resource, highlighting the international achievements of British nurses, but also contributing significantly to the body of knowledge in this area. Just a bit, a bit of background about the Foundation. We are an independent charity, closely affiliated with uh, the Royal College of Nursing, um, and our purpose really is as a grant maker, who, uh, like, whose aim really is to support and strengthen nursing midwifery and to, in order to improve the health and well-being for the public. We deliver this through three very specific uh, ways. Uh, first, we support individual nurses, midwives and healthcare support workers by providing grants. Whether it's somebody who's facing financial hardship or would like uh, to develop their own kind of skills, enhance their skills and develop their practice, we're able to provide funding to them. And the other the really important thing is you don't have to be a member of the RCN in order to access our grants. Any nurse, any midwife or healthcare support worker can approach us. Secondly, we invest in the professions by funding nursing and midwifery-led projects in our key areas, which at the moment, in terms of our priorities, are children and young people's mental health and learning disability nursing. And finally, we champion professions by supporting projects that raise the profile and public understanding of nursing and midwifery. Um, How we talked about courage, we talked about kindness, we talked about compassion. Um, equally, you know, the, and, and I'm sure that it, it wasn't an error, it, it, uh, you didn't mean to leave that out or anything like that, but I think this, the other part for me as, an, as a non-nurse is just the real skill and evidence-based approach that nurses take and the fact that, that actually I often hear nurses talk about, well, that's just something I do. Well, no, actually it isn't. It's actually really groundbreaking. So our role at the foundation, what we'd like, what we'd like to do is kind of promote that um, real innovation that we see in, in and as, as the director, it's been my absolute privilege, really, to witness firsthand the enormous difference uh, 
uh, that my charity has made to the professions throughout the UK. The libraries and ar archives, uh, sorry, the libraries and heritage centre, which is just to my uh, right here, and which holds the largest nursing library in Europe, I think that's still the case. Um, we, we're really pleased that that was one of our early grants that we made as a foundation. We, we uh, made a grant of about half a million pounds and, and, and redeveloped that, and I, you know, it's, it's a fantastic resource. Um, and it's a great example of the impact that our funding can have. The digital uh, resource that is being showcased this evening of the seven nurses who worked internationally um, illustrates really how British nurses have contributed to the wider world of international nursing in leadership, research, policy context, and through direct healthcare delivery overseas. Um, the, they include information from the collections of Mary Abbott, Marjorie Simpson and Sheila Quinn. And what's really lovely for me is that the funding we provided was made possible because, as Helen said, of a legacy that was left to the foundation by Mary Abbott. She had some very clear instructions about how she wanted it to be used. And we worked with uh, the libraries and archives service to try and kind of do that. But, you know, it's, it's demonstrating to me really how a gift in a will, and it wasn't a huge amount of money, but how a gift in a will can have a profound and lasting impact, uh, which will benefit future generations of nurses in the middle way. So, uh, you know, it's, it's great. We're handing out some leaflets if anybody's interested in in, um, uh, in, our, in leaving a will to the foundation, even a legacy to the foundation, should you be interested. But I hope that you all enjoy the evening and finding out more about this incredible resource. And I also hope that if you do want to find out a bit more about the RCF Foundation, you can either visit our website or you can, come, um, you can get in touch with us in, in other ways. But thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Deepa, and to, to recognise that the work that the Foundation does is a whole range of projects which are, uh, which are known and highly regarded by associations from right away around the world. But thank you for all the work that you do. Our first uh, speaker, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce, is Janet Hargreaves. Janet's the uh, Associate Dean from the University of Huddersfield and an active member of the UK Association for the history of nursing. Um, Fabulous that you can be with us, Janet, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to be here this evening. Really appreciate it. In 2013, I was awarded a National Teaching Fellowship, which included a grant. While I was waiting for the results, I dreamed that if successful, I would see if Medicines and Frontier would allow me to interview any of their nurses. I was very pleased that they did, and I recorded seven oral histories from six British nurses and one non-British nurse um, who were recruited during the 1990s. Working with Dr. Benny Gould Golding, who was a colleague, we analysed the data, published our findings, and deposited the recordings in the archive at the University of Huddersfield, a poster from our researchers at the back there. The nurses each chose a pseudonym. They are Chris, Joe, Sophia, Leslie, Sam, Alex, and Bo. Kashmir, Pakistan, Somalia, Sri Lanka, Rwanda, Zaire, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Cambodia, Bangladesh, China, Sudan, Afghanistan, and Haiti are just some of the countries that they worked in during their time with MSF. Their missions ranged from a few weeks to several years in one case, where the type of work and the nurses' role changed but she remained in the same country. This evening I'd like to share some of these nurses' experiences of international nursing with MSF. I'm using the transcript of the oral histories. I've tried to choose extracts that illustrate specific points, but also resonate across their collective experience. Firstly, maybe a little bit of background about MSF will be helpful. MSF, or Doctors Without Borders, was formed in 1971 in France by a group of doctors frustrated and disillusioned by volunteering in the Biafran conflict, as they felt organisations such as the International Red Cross were too entangled in national politics to give a voice to their suffering. One of the founders, Bernie Cushion, said, It's simple really, go where the patients are. It seems obvious, but at that time it was revolutionary. It was a revolutionary concept because 
world has got in the way. It's no coincidence that we called it Medicine Sans Frontier. MSF are very aware of the post-colonial legacy, that they carry of Northern Europeans interfering abroad, as it were. So they're very reflective and very focused. They aim to act fast, quickly getting medical relief set up at brand level, to be secular and independent, so that their hands are not tied by the local or international politics. And to offer témoignage, a French word meaning to bear witness. Chris explains this to me. The phrase is témoignage, and it's witnessing. So you go into a situation where there's population in danger, where there's a sense of moral outrage at what is happening, and you help them. And it's about that health aspect. So that you're dealing with the health situation, and then you take that, what you've personally witnessed and experienced, and you speak about it in order to effect change. Because whatever has caused that moral outrage, you want that to stop. Chris was not the only nurse to express these feelings. I soon came to realise that their agreement to record it linked to this principle of terminage. They worried that what they had achieved was never going to be enough. Sharing and continuing to bear witness to their own experience, to the role of MSF, and most importantly, to the people they had aided. For this reason, I'm doubly pleased to have an opportunity to share their histories again. So, why did they do it? Although two of the nurses were springboarded into their international work through life events, such as divorce, all had sought opportunities to travel, and several had worked or volunteered abroad prior to working for MSF. Although this was enjoyable, it left them dissatisfied and thirsty for more meaningful engagement. Leslie summed up the way many of them felt. She had spent six years working in a and &E, before taking a year off to travel. And she says, so that really opened my eyes to the world. Got me, you know, got me itchy feeting, basically. Even before that, I'd always been fascinated. So later, I went travelling in Asia. And then I just decided, when I came back, that yeah, I actually would like to see more of the world, but I want to see it as part of it, rather than just travelling. They all took their quest for involvement very seriously and spent time developing their skills and preparing themselves for the idea of working somewhere that might be dangerous. Indeed, MSF would not have recruited them otherwise. Skills include trauma nursing, midwifery and education, as well as specialist courses such as the Tropical Diseases course at the School of Oriental and African Studies. Several of them seem to have done this course. And MSF and other, I can see nods, and other um, organisations often talk to students on these courses about what they might do with their knowledge. This is Alex speaking. If you're going to do it well, really be there. Well, I moved into a &E nursing, I did a tropical nursing diploma, I've also done an MVQ in further adult education. So I spent five years basically building up my skills, and what I didn't want to do was go out there and not be skilled enough. Alex talked, also talked about preparing mentally, about thinking about her motivations, why she was doing it, and how prepared she was to actually take on that risk. This serious commitment continued throughout her careers, and several of them took breaks from international missions to improve their skills and usefulness. Uh, for example, Bo talks about completing a three-year BSc in social anthropology. She says, during that three-year period, MSF will phone me up and say, uh, could you go to Palestine for Christmas break? Or um, could you go to the Congo during the summer? And I was evaluating and assessing needs in places like Palestine and Gaza and on the West Bank. My observation was that the Human Resources Department at London MSF was very skilled and very shrewd at identifying and effectively deploying people and caring about their long-term well-being. So what was it like? Even though they were all experienced travellers, and many of them had worked with other agencies, MSF would be a bit of a shock. When I went to the UK, when I spoke with the UK coordinator, she explained that some people find it's just not for them, or not what they thought that they were seeking, either returning early from their first mission, or completing one mission and just never coming back again, never making contact again, just going and saying, not for me. Um, most of the interviewees had found their first mission difficult. They did not feel skilled enough, they were often justifiably afraid, or felt like an outsider. 
It took courage and resilience to carry on and to return for further work. But all of the women that I, all of the nurses that I uh, interviewed did. They shared so many experiences with me that I've struggled to choose examples for you. Um, I, I could just read these transcripts all evening. Uh, they are just such amazing uh, um, uh, testimonies. Undoubtedly, so I've tried to choose some, some different areas for you. Undoubtedly, all of them had amazing, life-affirming moments, despite often harrowing, terrible, terrible times. Here were just three extracts explaining that one. This first one is from Sam. It was her first mission in Tanzania. She was helping to set up her run clinics. She says, I didn't really have a clue what I was doing when I got there. It was all quite scary, and I really felt it was a huge responsibility. But I think I quickly learned, actually, that I could just get on with it. And I think what she meant at that point was, there wasn't a sister somewhere, there wasn't somebody else there going to tell her what to do and set up her jobs for the day. She had to get on with it and do it. So we made schedules to visit the clinics, some of which were many hours away travelling by car. But five of them were only reachable by boat. So we had a little boat and we went off for days on end to these remote villages, which was amazing fun. I mean, my goodness, it was fantastic. For Sophia, it was the adrenaline rush. She said, I love it when things are chaos. Just send me in. If things are too organised, I don't know where to put myself. Sophia went on to say that she'd mostly sought out and been chosen for work in conflict zones. Her choice, clearly, but also one where she felt most useful, but also where she found it very, very hard. Leslie described the mission supporting earthquake victims in Kashmir. And again, the immediate aftermath was very, very tiring, very, very stressful. But she says, for me, it was like a dream job. And I'd just walk to the helipad in the morning, and I'd get on my helicopter, off and off we'd go into the mountains. And the beautiful scenery, the lovely Kashmiri people, it was just fantastic. Another time, I was camping up there for six weeks, getting a health centre running. And it was lovely. It was a great job. This process of emergency response and creation of infrastructure was similar in many projects short and long, where NSF was endeavouring to identify a need that could be met, working with local and international agencies and researchers to learn from and improve from their responses. Chris summed this up, talking about a leadership role in Bangladesh on a long-term NSF project dealing with flooding, malnutrition and subsequent cholera as major issues. In an emergency situation with NSF, you are very focused. You know what you're there for. You're there to deal with the health consequences of the emergency, and you have the resources. So you go out and you do a rapid assessment. There are toolkits, manuals, and plans. All very fast. You write your report, your recommendations. It's authorised. You go in. You set things up. You stay. You make a difference. So, for example, we set up a mobile medical units to go out in boats to places where the houses were flooded. People were living on the roofs. And the people in the boats were able to treat the main issues, which were diarrhea and acute respiratory tract infection for children, who died if they weren't treated. And then we set up a partnership with the local NGO and Oxfam, so we could take food out of the boats, and people did the acute malnutrition assessments, and they could identify who to give the food to. So we really enabled things to happen. The nurses all wanted to see their work was making a long-term difference by creating sustainable projects that would outlast NSF stay. But this was always difficult, as the intervention could also create imbalance. The Rwandan genocide was a particularly complex and, and traumatic example. Two of the nurses had been at the forefront of the initial help to the refugees, arriving in their thousands where little provision existed. Cholera, starvation and intergroup violence were just some of the terrible difficulties they faced. But gradually, more and more aid arrived and a huge camp emerged. This is from Joe, who was there from the first refugees coming over the line uh, and stayed there for about seven or eight months. And this is where she's recounting towards the end of that period. By the time I finished, you know, it was a great running camp. Very good. I had two very good translators and I was running by that time four outpatients clinics in the camp. And they were so good they ended up being the managers. So by the time I moved out, really, they were running the camps for the local staff, you know. 
And it was a success in that way, in the end. But she also talks about it being really complicated because they've managed to turn around the situation with the refugees so well that the people, the Zaire people in the area were actually noticing that the refugees were getting better health care than they were on there. And so they began to say, hang on a minute, we want, you know, you're looking after these people, what about us? This is our country too. Clearly the work could be very frightening. Joe returned to Zaire, to the Zaire border area, uh, a little while later to do another mission. And uh, she got involved in a group who uh, were over, who walked over the border to do some reconnaissance. And they all got kidnapped by um, a gunpoint. She recounts this, it's a long story and we'd be here until midnight, so. Um, uh, fortunately, they got released partly because the, the MSF logistic, logistician who was with them was extremely skilled and did a lot of very sharp negotiating and he actually got them out and got them back over the border again. Several nurses related times where they've been evacuated very, very quickly, just go, leave everything behind, your patients, everything behind. Um, the two incidents below happened to Bo and Alex when they were new or inexperienced in small teams in areas of conflict. Bo was sent to Somalia at a time of very intense fighting and danger. I remember, you know, being apprehensive about it and thinking, well, there are other doctors and nurses there, so it must be okay. I mean, they're there, I can do that. But when I turned up on the Hercules, they didn't even switch the engines off because it wasn't safe to do so. I was on my own, so I kind of sort of got off the plane and I was on the sand, no tarmac. And this guy walked up to me and said, welcome to hell. And Alex explains, six weeks into my mission, I had a very frightening incident where you had to cross a river where a bridge had been. It was not down, so you went by canoe. And so we basically went across, and I was with the driver, and I was aware that he was having a big argument with this massive African guy. And then he chased us across the river, and we got to the other side, lots of fisticuffs, and I managed to get him into the Land Rover, this is her driver. And I said, you just got to drive, if you hang around here, they've all got their guns out. And again, Alex here was very inexperienced, and she's suddenly finding, actually, if I don't take leadership here, if I don't sort this situation out, then I'm, I'm, I'm done for. However, it was not always so dramatic. Much was routine, hard work. For example, setting up clinics, training and supervising. It could also be, also be very isolating. Jo spent several months on a mission in a very remote, very poor area of South Sudan with a medical team treating a parasitic disease called leishmaniasis. Valuable work, and in addition, because they were the medical team there, they got lots of people uh, the extract I'm going to read from her here is about their living conditions. You'd fly out to your project just on a small plane with two or three people, and so we'd literally be dropped out there, and that would be it. Hopefully the plane will get back every two weeks. They'd drop us food and mail if we were lucky. But that was it, really. So you were really in the middle of nowhere. Nowhere to go at all, living in little Sudanese huts of straw and mud. We were in a little round compound, and there was one room for us to eat in the kitchen of sorts, with a gas burner in there and an array of tins. There was no fresh food whatsoever. The isolation for Leslie and Sophia was very different, again, but no less difficult to live through. This is Leslie contrasting VSO with MSF. The biggest change for me was seeing the world through a car window. As a VSO in Tanzania, in this village, I was completely free. I was part of the community. I knew everyone, and I could go in and out of people's houses. And then as soon as you start working with MSF, well, there's obviously an understanding of rightly so. All these security rules. In Cambodia, you couldn't even get for a pee, because there's landmines where we were, and it was still a bit insecure in those days. Sophia takes this further, talking about the emotional toll of what she called bunker admissions. But after four and a half months, I was like, I think this is too much for me. There's being imprisoned because we were imprisoned. It was a bunk admission. I mean, in Somalia, we were imprisoned, and in bunk admissions, people go crazy. These situations where the nurses knew what they were doing was fraught with difficulty, but still yearned to be close to the people they were aimed to help had a real toll on their health. And they all, at some point, had to make the what next decision. The urge to keep going is well recognised in aid workers and in people like war correspondents. 
The nurses acknowledged that this could be draining and damaging. Alex said, but I also felt there was something very unanchored about what we were doing, going backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards, and would it in the end make me a happy person or not? And I thought in the end, it probably would be quite damaging. And Chris, this is Chris, it probably would be really difficult, I thought, but I wasn't going to just run away, and the easy option would be to take another mission. But I decided that I would come back and put down some roots. I think the really difficult thing, and this is where you're talking about Korea, is what do you do after that? They all maintained a deep respect for the people in the countries they had worked in. Several went on to work for other agencies and to continue to work abroad for many years. Some applied for jobs within the NSF, some, for example, in research and planning and in recruiting and uh, supporting new volunteers. All still took an interest in NSF, continued to travel and at times yearned to return. I do not think any of them would totally rule out another mission, and they acknowledge this in different ways. And to finish, I think I'd like to finish with this quote from Bo, looking back on several decades, and this may be how many people have done this sort of work for you. There's a strong impulse in me, and it doesn't happen now, but it was happening until a couple of years ago, where I would see something happening on the news, and I think, I've got to go out and help in that situation. So fortunately, I think I've got that into perspective now, but I think it's part of my character. I think that I have a strong impulse to do something, if I think it's unfair, if I think I can do something to help. Thank you. Um, Janet, thank you so much, and your words and the words of all of those nurses that you shared, I think, have really brought to to life, the, the reality, the, the real ex experiences, and uh, as, as well as the, the risks, danger, the courage. The other thing that I was struck by was how many of those nurses, they were the people who were going to really remote, rural, hostile in, environments. And the world currently has got a big ambition to deliver universal health coverage, health care to, to every, everyone. But it's nurses. It's the nurses who are, who are absolutely key and critical to, to delivering that. There are hundreds of nurses who work for, for MSF, for ICRC, the International Organisation of Migration is another really important one as, as well. And the, um, the, one, the one thing that I say not to, I say to the nurses at MSF when I, when I meet them, but to some of their, their leaders as well, the only thing that I do is change your name to Infirmeras Sans Frontières. Nurses without orders rather than doctors, uh, doctors without orders. It's interesting, I will hold you, but it's interesting when I when I went to the office and put my email in the office and said, Is there any chance I could interview your nurses? And what she said was, Is everybody interviews our doctors, nobody interviews our nurses. And, and that's why I got in and I, I was, oh, Thank you. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Well, there'll be some time for questions at, at, at the end, but let's uh, move on um, to uh, uh, to our next, our next speaker. What has Barbara still, well, not done? <laughs> not done. The, 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 the mother of nurse practitioners worked for, for, WH, uh, for WHO, for Intra Health, I think, in pretty much every region of the world. And, and in my humble view, uh, the most significant global campaign for nursing that we've ever, we've ever had, Nursing Now, Barbara led that as well. So, Barbara, of course. Say this table. I mean, to move the table. And then I want to give everybody a stink up, <laughs> just in case I start leaving. And I'm thankful. And I won't be able to see it at the top. Oh, you're a genius. And who changes the slides? And you can use the map. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Now we're going to see. Um, so, thank you so much for inviting me to uh, give my personal reflections. I'm, I'm very honoured to be able to do so. And thank you, Janet, for sharing those voices of nurses, which resonated so strongly with me. Um, 
Uh, at one stage, my crowd are based in South Sudan, so respect, kudos um, to the nurses who were there. And thank you all for coming. It's great to see so many of you with an interest in international nursing. So I've been asked to share my personal reflections after what is a really very long career, which we won't go into now. Um, and I think one of the things that strikes me is what does international mean? You know, we talk about international nursing, but we're talking about several things, aren't we? We're talking about the kinds of things Janet was just talking about, which is when nurses join an international NGO and go and work overseas for extended periods of time. But we also use it, or we did in WHO, to mean working in many countries. So WHO is international, but they have offices in all these countries, you know, and they work and they act as a sort of network to bring them together. Um, we also talk about applying knowledge to different countries, so it's like international work, and ICM, of course, does that a lot. There's a lot of uh, wonderful papers and, and movies available on the ICM website, which are applicable in many, many settings. Um, so it's important to acknowledge that. We also mean that by international work, and, and people go out as consultants to share knowledge, and I'm going to return to that in a moment. Um, and nursing now, of course, what we did, we connected many countries, usually with social media mostly because of the pandemic, but it turned out to be a blessing, you know, because we could have everybody joining in conferences from everywhere around the world thinking that. That was amazing. So that was international, though I was sitting in my little study in Kent, you know, doing this, but I would say it was international working. So it's important to think about what we're talking about with international and what we want it to be. So, you know, the international department at the RCN, what do you want it to be? And I think that's a very important question, um, not for me to answer, but all you guys. So in my career, I have been incredibly fortunate to do all of those things. Um, and what I'm going to share with you tonight, you'll be very happy to hear, is not a recount of the last 25 years, but just three tales, um, three big lessons, if you like, that I have learned and may resonate with you, um, I think, I hope. So, the first one is about listening. I went to WHO from here. I've been in the RCN Institute here as a principal lecturer um, for about seven or eight years, and I was asked to go to the World Health Organization in Geneva to do a very specific job. And when I got there, I didn't know anything really much about it. I knew a bit about it because I'd done some, some work in um, Eastern Europe, and I, so I knew something about it. But I, you know, I didn't know much about it. But when I got there, what I discovered was that the WHO was exactly the opposite of nursing. So whereas nursing is 90% women, the WHO is 90% men. And women, all the women they counted as women in the organisations, were mostly the support staff, the G staff. In my department, there were no senior women. None at all. So meetings were absolutely incredible. They were, you know, men sitting around tables, strategically positioned, and repeating the same thing over and over again, and the boss saying, thank you so much, Dr. Jones, that was absolutely stunning. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith, that's a really good idea. And I'm thinking, it's the same idea. So I was thinking to myself, well, what can I do? What is my superpower as a nurse that I can do that none of these guys do. And you know what it is? Listening. So I went into meetings and instead of you know worrying about what my contribution would be, I listened very deeply to what was going on. I made notes. And when they got to the end, I said, so if I could just reflect back to you what you've been saying here, sounds to me like there are three key points. There, there, there. And I think if we're going to move on, you're probably going to have to resolve A and B so that we can actually find a solution. 
and they would look at me wide-eyed and say, that's amazing, how did you do that? How did I do it? I listened. <laughs> I listened to what was being said. And in fact, I was so incredibly good at it that they sent me to Harvard on a course to become a negotiator. And I think to yourself, it's all smoke and mirrors. It's like, you know, I brought this from nursing because one thing we have to do in nursing, we have to listen to what people are saying to us, don't we? And that is a superpower and we don't often think about it. But what I've learned in my career is when you do international work, it's probably the most critical skill to have. Because, as we used to say in nursing now, and I do believe this, I believe it profoundly, everybody has something to teach and everybody has something to learn. And once you get that into your head and you start listening, you realise everybody's teaching you something, even if it's just that they open their mouths far too often and they really shouldn't. <laughs> you know, but you learn. And what I learned from WHO was that politics, I'm sure Howard will sympathise and will understand what I'm saying, politics is one of the key things you have to learn in international health. You have to understand the politics of the context you're in and the politics that are going to shape things like who gets the funding, um, who's got the power, what's the role of women here. All of those political questions with big and small P's, you really have to understand. And that's, you know, that's new territory for many nurses. So after I did my training as a negotiator, um, I, um, uh, I actually took a, a master's, another master's degree in development, international development management, because I realised I didn't know enough. I needed to know different things as well as use my transferable skills. So it's always worth asking that question. So the second lesson is be prepared for uncertainty. You see, for every complex problem, there's an answer that's clear, simple, and wrong. Um, and this is just one of the many diagrams that I learned to draw when I did my course in international development management. The second lesson is, and Janet has outlined this extremely well, you have to be prepared to live with uncertainty. Because here, just as a reference point, Parts. 
So uncertainty is something you have to start to live with it. And it might also be uncertainty in infrastructure. Now this is a picture of South Sudan, Janet. Um, it's the road where our office was. And I, I was the manager for two years in South Sudan. And when I went there, my counterpart said, oh, Barbara, I found an office. And I said, wow, that's amazing, because it was the end of the war and everywhere had fallen down. So she took me to see it. There it is. <laughs> So, you've got to be kind of optimist and, you know, you've got to recognise that somebody will show you this and say, this is our office. Um, we did actually work it into some fairly decent shape, but we only had electricity at certain times, the water you couldn't drink at all, we had no internet. You know, it was, I mean, those things are extraordinary and when you're in, based in a country and working in those conditions, you have to learn to live with uncertainty. Many nurses find that difficult, um, although I have to say many nurses are also st stellar at dealing with it. This was one of the wards, um, and this is the other side, of, uh, of the other kind of structural uncertainty. Um, you can see there's no mattresses on some of those beds. You can see there's nothing, basically nothing. So, you know, this is a very important point, I think. I come from a rich country. I, you know, I come from the UK. It's a rich country. I've worked in the USA. I've worked in Australia. You know, I know how to do a literature search thanks to many of the librarians here. Um, I, you know, I know what to do with it. I know what evidence means. You go in there, and you've got to think, what's good enough? You've got to use your evidence in a different way. What is good enough for this? It's got to be the best I can possibly do. But it sure ain't going to be what I could do in UCH down, down the road here. So it's a different, do you see what I'm saying? It's a very different environment. And in that, it's easy sometimes to be thinking, you kind of, you know, you, you can begin to think, well, look at all I know, look at all I can do. But I go back to this adage, everybody has something to teach and everybody has something to learn. And I learned so much from the people I worked with in those environments about coping in those environments. What do you do if there's no water to wash your hands? What do you do? So, you know, you've got to, people who were there would say to me, oh, well, we'll show you, we'll show you what to do. And, you know, the things I learned there, I could not have learned anywhere else, I think. And it's very important to remember that. And that brings me to the third point I want to make, which is remember, wherever you go, to take with you your sense of wonder. And you know, people work in international health, and I've seen this happen. They become disillusioned and crusty, and oh, nothing works, everybody's corrupt, oh, you know. And I mean, it's horribly common. But I just want to say that if you can manage to keep your sense of wonderful, and there is so much that is wonderful in what you do, in the people you meet, the people you work with, the places you go, um, it is wonderful. It's not a holiday, I have to say. <laughs> um, you know, we're not going on a jolly because we actually have to do some work there. So sometimes you do feel tired and disillusioned how will I go on and all I want is a big cold glass of San Pellegrino, you know. But you meet these great people and these are some nurses in Kenya that I met when I was there and this guy who's in bed, um, he was having a bit of a ding dong with that nurse in a nice kind of a way. And she was so patient and kind with him and he was laughing. Um, and I always take away that moment as, you know, she did so well and very difficult circumstances. And this is um, a young, uh, um, a male nurse in Kenya, a man nurse, with um, a child. And look at the family. Can you see, everybody's smiling, aren't they? Um, and he's smiling at the child. Can you see how he's, he's connected with them? And those connections, when people make connections, it doesn't matter where they are really, but this was particularly wonderful because the child was quite sick and, and of course the, you know, the family were worried. 
And look at this one. This is a nurse about to give uh, a class to these women. I think it was on family planning, if I remember rightly. But, um, oh, there's some men there too. Yeah, so it probably was. And I just love that expression and, you know, her sort of tenderness, really. And what can she teach us about tenderness? Um, I thought it was lovely. And this was a, oh, this is a wonderful woman in Namibia. Um, she had retired, and because they were so short-staffed in Namibia, particularly at the time of HIV treatment when it was beginning, when I was working there, um, they asked retired nurses to come back. And so she is in her 70s. Uh, she decided to come back. And she was interviewed about her experience of coming back. And she said, um, I knew nothing about uh, the modern treatments and how they were carried out, she said. But I knew a lot about how to talk to people and how to get them to come to the clinic. So the young nurses taught me the treatments, and I taught them how to talk to the patients. And I thought that was such a lovely story. And every time I see this picture of her, I'm kind of reminded um, of, of how lovely it was to meet her and what an inspiration she was. And this, of course, is good old nursing now. This is Thailand. Um, what an experience to meet nurses from around the world. What an experience. I mean, it was beyond amazing. I know how you do this a lot, don't you? And, you know, it's, it's wonderful to, to be connected. And it, you can find out what you share um, in terms of experience and values and lessons, you know, by talking to these nurses. And I was very privileged to run a few groups for students and, and nurses, and their enthusiasm um, keeps it alive, folks. It keeps it alive. So, yeah, nursing now, what a wonderful international experience. So, I just wanted to share that with you, to say that, you know, this is, these are aspects of the wonder of international nursing. Um, and although it's hard, and though you have to be prepared to work hard, it's still incredibly amazing to be able to do it. And I feel immensely privileged to have had 25 years of working internationally and, you know, to, to still be in contact with many of these nurses that I've met over the years. So in that regard, I want to end with this quote. Perhaps travel cannot prevent bigotry, but by demonstrating that all people cry, laugh, eat, worry and die, it can introduce the idea that if we try and understand each other, we may even become friends. Yay, my orange eh? Thank you. Wonderful as always, um, Barbara, and you know, yet more colour of the reality of global health. I cannot tell you that um, the picture that you paint of WHO <laughs> has has changed completely, but it has changed. It has changed, and I think, Barbara, that you know, we have to acknowledge your work, the likes of Jane Salvage as well. The early Pioneers of nursing at WHO who set it on a on a path to be different and to be more inclusive of nursing. And your reflections on the politics, you know that you you know that you were going to tempt me to respond by by mentioning the by mentioning the, the politics. WHO is a member's cup. The members are the countries. WHO is an evidence-led organisation, but it has to manage that evidence within the context of the politics. And what others have said to me and what I've seen and witnessed over the last two years is that that politics, big global politics, has been on display like never before at WHO meetings that I've sat in on, where reports have come forward on things like attacks on healthcare, on safety of healthcare workers, and countries take political positions to prevent the report becoming part of the record. And why that is 
why that is so difficult for us is that when we talk about global health, we know that we need cooperation, collaboration, we need multilateralism like never before to deal with those global health challenges. But we are at a time where politically countries seem to be struggling more than they ever have done before to come together and provide that united, that, that united leadership. My hope in that, my way of hope in all of that, is that I think that that often leaves the space for nurses and for other healthcare workers to do things that you both described in terms of building the relationships, the partnerships, the collaborations, the plans to get things done, to get things, to get things moving. Right. So, you dangled the bait because I had to, I had to say yeah. it. It's now time um, to uh, have the tour of the digital resources and I think it's Sophie who is going to, Sophie, sorry, you're there. Sophie, the, the, the floor is yours, thank you. Well, I'm just going to move this back. So. <laughs> um, so I
trying to work towards the same goals all over the world. And it's just such a lovely little encapsulation of um, the efforts that are going on at home and abroad. And this is a really lovely blood donation uh, badge from Thailand, um, which is just really unusual. Uh, I think my personal favourite in this collection is a badge for a Red Cross staff at the Seoul Olympics in 1988. I'll just put this up here. Which I, I had no idea that Red Cross staff worked at the Olympics uh, before I saw this. So that was a lovely uh, little insight there. And you can see all the detail here with the logo uh, from the Olympics and the rings. And just to finish us off, um, we have a lot of oral history interviews at the OCN archives. Um, there's over 500 main interviews in several collections. And they're some of my favourite items in the archive because you get to hear people talk about their lives and rather than a written document where you just get sort of one account, you get to hear the emotion in people's voice and like what they care about. Uh, so I just thought I'd play you this clip, and this is Barbara Fawkes, and she's talking about a uh, time she spent in Iran in the late 70s. And this is about uh, some less than ideal accommodations that she was staying in, so uh, yeah, it's a bit of a tale. <laughs> in Geneva, um, I thought, well, I wouldn't have to do very much, and I didn't make any uh, cha many changes internationally, but I did try and go to the countries where they were having problems. And, um, oh, it's, it's fascinating to go to Nepal and India and Pakistan and, oh, um, just, just after the Shah, no, just before the Shah left uh, Iran. And that was terrible. <laughs> we always um, asked the countries that we were going to, to arrange accommodation in the hotel which would be convenient. I got to Iran and no, I wasn't to go to a hotel, I was to go to Princess Ashraf Hospital, to their um, associations, a house in the grounds of the hospital. Well, and I said I didn't want to go there. I wanted to go to the hotel, but no, I had to. The reason was that the matron at Prince Princess Ashraf's hospital wouldn't let the Nurses Association use the new headquarters that they'd built. Um, and they thought if I stayed there, uh, it'd be all right. Well, the first night, it was about eight o'clock and it was dark, and they returned me to the um, house and they left me and there was no one there there'd never been anyone living in the house and they locked me in incredible <laughs> so i didn't know i thought oh don't be so silly it's not, nothing to worry about but i had to do a round of the house to find out what was what and it was terribly hot because no one had ever lived in it and they had three bed sitting rooms for visitors. And it, the room was so hot, I opened the windows and there was a balcony. <coughs> and while I was going around the house, when I got back to my room, three cats had come in. <laughs> so I had to dispose of the cats. Oh, <laughs> and next morning, about seven o'clock, the door was unlocked and they brought some breakfast in. I thought at least one of them would have stayed. And then on the last night, the matron had had the electricity turned off. And when I got in, it was about 11 o'clock, we'd had a dinner party. And I was leaving at five next morning and I hadn't packed. I mean, I wasn't worried about it being dark if I'd packed. So I had to stand on the balcony and call to the porter for three quarters of an hour before anyone heard me. <laughs> so you never know what you're going to meet. That's right. That's right. Incredible experience. So yeah, a bit of a comedy of errors. <laughs>
and they chose them to go for that work. And it wasn't happenstance that they went. There was very much a sense that it was, this is what I'm going to do. This is a really important part of my life. And I think that was, um, that was maybe the thing that, uh, they didn't, they were nurses who went out and did it. They were international nurses. You know, it was, yeah. it was, it was somewhere right down in here. Yeah, yeah. In my family story. And, and Sophie, you you have had these really personal insights. You've listened yeah. to voices, you've read diaries, you've seen people's past books. That's not quite frightening if someone said that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> insights. What's your sense? You must have a sense of their characters. I mean, yeah. yeah. I, I had um, one thing that I was surprised by, especially looking at things from sort of 50s, 60s, which is how it reminded me. I guess uh, it's probably a bit biased to me, but I was half expecting maybe it's like a colonial mindset from people. But Mary Abbott's diaries, uh, there are beautiful sections about her going to local Hindi festivals and like trying to learn local languages. And it was just, I just got this wonderful sense of like how caring and compassionate she was. And it really was a privilege to work with these collections. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Please. Um, just a question for Jenna also, sorry, just following up on a scene, but did you find, or did we able to follow up with the nurses that you did have interviewed, were they able to reintegrate into a nursing profession or whatever their career goal must have been after leaving NSF or after leaving the position? Do tell us who you are. Do tell us who you are. I'm an American nurse um, in the UK now, trying to do my nursing here, so I'm okay. Um, I interviewed them in the, about 2013. And all of them by then were doing something else. Two of them worked here in the MSF offices in London, so they chose to meld their career into, into, into work in the MSF. Um, several of them have gone and worked with other organisations, partly because they wanted to continue to do the work, and some because they wanted to stay abroad. So they found other organisations to work with when they were not doing the active missions with MSF. Um, several of them went on to work for charities. One of them, and I, I must admit, I, I was conscious I was getting towards the end of my time, so I, I didn't read one of the last quotes. One of them had a wonderful relationship with the NHS, which was unique of the seven. I've only got seven nurses, it's not a massive kind of data set for anything. But seven of the nurses talked about how frustrating they felt coming back to nurse in England. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a, a clip from one of them that she's back in A&E, and somebody's whinging because they've had to wait six hours to have their finger looked at and just thinking, my God, you know, somebody walked to my clinic with their arm blown off, you know, for the same amount of time that you've been sitting here, you know, crying because you haven't been looked after and there's all these other people who need me. Whereas one of the nurses said, I, 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 actually, I don't have a problem with it. I'm no more frustrated by the NHS, I think, than I would be if I'd, if I'd never been out, you know, it, it is what it is. And she managed to negotiate with the manager that she would take six months off. And she would go out with MSF for six months. When she felt ready, when the need came, she'd say, you got a mission for me, got something for me. And then she would come back to the job. And she was still, at the time that I interviewed her, saying, they're not so keen on me doing it anymore, and I'm not quite sure whether they'll let me go again, but I'm not shutting the door I'm doing it. And she said, that's all right, I'm a professional. I'm not a volunteer. I'm a professional. This is my career. And, and I'm sure in her work, for all that she was very um, self-effacing, Oh, just little me sort of thing. I'm sure that she brought an enormous amount into her work in A&E, in, in the town that she lived in, and I'm sure she took from her experience here loads and loads of stuff out of them. So they all seemed to have assimilated. That said, clearly they were chosen by the MSF office to, inter to be interviewed by me. So they were a subset of people who were confident in their experience with NSF, who were um, happy to still be involved and were still known to the NSF office. There may be other people who, who weren't so happy. They all had some sort of post-traumatic stress and all acknowledged that they have PTSD and they've dealt with in different ways. But they all come through that. Um, Barbara was kind enough in her remarks to, um, to name-check uh, an ICM project that we did with the BBC in school. Caring with Courage, and if you serve BBC Caring with Courage, you'll come across it. The BBC came to us and said, um, 
we would like to film some examples from around the world of innovations in nursing practice, but we, we, we'd like you to direct us more to um, uh, lower middle income um, settings. And they went off with about a dozen wonderfully produced because they're BBC short, short films. When I look at those, when I look at those, what is so common between all of those, those films? Um, firstly, you need the nurse with, 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 with the knowledge, with the skills, um, with the education and preparation for decision making, and with all of the things, and didn't mention this as well. So, you, so you, you need the expert prepared practitioner. Secondly, even though they're in remote and rural and very different settings, there's a piece of technology involved. Often a mobile, but maybe a laptop or something. A call to all of all of them, um, and really quite inspirational. I urge you to watch those films if you can. They are extremely uh, moving, I think, and really illustrate what nurses do yeah. around the world. Yeah, and it was um, <coughs> trying to encourage BBC to do a second a second series at the moment, but yeah. they're uh, yeah, and you can use them in you know events and, and other settings as well. Um, Time is, time is ticking, but, 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 but any more any more comments or observations people would please? I was just going to ask, you know, to end the video, um, I mean, this type of work seems very difficult and uh, hard, but if there's a nurse that was considering going into this type of work, do you think everyone's cut out for it? Do you think everybody can learn from it, or would you need caution to some people that might not be able? that maybe they should not consider it. <laughs> um, I would say that um, you do have to be willing to live with a lot of uncertainty in international law work. All kinds of uncertainty. Where's your next meal coming from? Can I drink the water? You know, what are the politics in this area? Who should, who should I talk to? Who shouldn't I talk to? It's constantly like that. So if there's somebody who really is not comfortable with that, I would say maybe go with somebody and have a taster and exactly see what it's like. If you, you know, working at WHO HQ is not like that. Well, <laughs> I won't go there. Um, it's, it's, it's very different. Work. And, and now it's much more about evidence and sharing evidence and contacting people and you know doing um, sort of implementation projects. And I think that would be a, a good partnership with the RCN um, at times. I know at the moment there is a British nurse, Emily, who's uh, working at the WHO um, CM Chief Nurses Office um, and you know doing a great great job there. So I think that's a different thing. So it's, you know, as I was saying, really, international work is so many things. Um, working with an NGO is different again. You know, and I work for WHO, I'd go to a country, there'd be a car waiting for me, I'd be taken through passports, into this big swish car, driven to a great hotel, you know, and everybody going, who in WHO? So when I started working for a non-profit, and I was just deployed overseas, I, I got to the airport, there was nobody there. I had to go with everybody else through the lines, you know, and um, the hotel was usually pretty dreadful. Um, so it was like, it's a whole different world. And then if you work for MSF, you, and as I do, you know, actually in South Sudan, you know, you know, you may live in a tent, which I did in South Sudan. So everything, you know, it all depends on where you want to go, what your aspirations may be. And I would echo what Jana said, um, what the MSF nurses said, that you do need to be prepared. Mm -hmm. It's not exactly like nursing. There are a lot of transferable skills, but you need additional add-on things to make you really functional. So, sorry, that's a long way of answering that. I, I, well, I, think I'm I'm not, sure I, did. I think, I, I think you, you covered it, Barbara. So right at the very beginning, over the last year, 18 months, um, I've had through faint and weak Wi-Fi connections spoken to nurses in Ukraine, in Afghanistan, in Myanmar, in Sudan in the last in the last week as as as, as well. And, and I listen to what they're going through and what they do this and I could I do that? Could I do that? Really um, 
you know, so the reality being, you know, understanding and knowing what the reality of the situations are is hugely, hugely, hugely important to do the preparation, to talk to people, to explore different organisations. Having said all of that, but if you've got something in your belly which is, I think I might be able to do this, I think this is something that I could do, follow that as well, follow that as well, so don't be, don't be put off, do the preparation, but don't be, but don't, but don't be put off, because I think that the people who we sit here um, are, are, are they're, I mean, they're remarkable and they're, ins and, and they're, they're inspirational, but they're, 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 they're very quickly, it's, it's not just leading the healthcare response, but they're often then leading a, a community, a society, a humanitarian response as well. And they're not just making the case for healthcare, but they're making the case for rights, for justice, for access to education, for community engagement and involvement as well. You really see how nursing, you know, we, we write about it, don't we? And we see it in the books about, you know, nursing's the answer to the, you know, the sustainable development goals and all the rest of it. You see this in practice for those nurses who were in there, who were in, who, who were in their, in those settings, I think. I just, can I just echo one thing you said um, about pre being prepared? I think this is, this is a lesson I've learned in Afghanistan. I was deployed to Afghanistan for a year um, in 2017, I think it was, uh, just before I came back here. And um, we had to do, of course, a lot of security training. Weeks of security training. And I was thinking, oh, not all security training. Because, you know, everywhere you go, you have to do it for ICN, you go to WHO, you know, just weeks. I mean, it's like learning, you know, the aeroplane. There's two doors at the front, two doors behind, the exit may be behind you, over and over again. And we had to walk the escape route, and we had to learn in the event of this, there's this, 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 and this, you know. What was it? And you had to repeat it back until we are just going crazy. Anyway, we did it because everybody said you need to do it. And would you know that when I was in Afghanistan, my hotel was bombed with me in it. Um, and you know, the ceiling came down, the windows came in, and I was there in the bedroom. And I, I sort of immediately leapt out of bed. I was in the night time, middle of the night, and of course there was a huge noise and I panicked and went sat on, I just sat down on the floor and I just thought, I know what to do. It was quite extraordinary. I just thought, I know what I've got to do now. And I did it. One, two, three, four. And you know, and then of course I, I knew what I actually I, they said um, block the door in case the Taliban come up the stairs. <laughs> So somehow, I never will know how, I moved a giant sofa and blocked the door <laughs> it. must have been the adrenaline. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, oh, the sofa. <laughs> but you know, it really speaks to what Howard says, I think. And, and it speaks to things like fire drills in this building. Do them, you know, because you just don't know. And if you think about international work, do all the security training because you just don't know. And that is, that's the sort of dire uncertainty that Howard is talking about. And that's why, Barbara, you still always wear your combat boots. Yes, I do. <laughs> 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 you know each other, you know each other. Um, one for one for one. Um, any more? Or? You know, I was Barbara. I, I, my name is Stella. Um, hi. Hi, hi um, In Rwanda and uh, um, Sudan, were you deployed during the crisis in the country? Not in Rwanda. Not in Rwanda. Okay. So there, I did work with um, uh, one of the, the doctors from Rwanda um, who had to leave during the, the Rwandan genocide. Yeah. That was terrible. I have been there and I've seen the genocide museum, which is. <sighs> And it's uh, the, 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 me the mental health impacts and the support yeah. that's required for these nurses to do this job is yeah. huge, huge, huge. We're, we're involved in a lot of work at the moment trying to support the nurses, providing me mental health support for, for, for the nurses in, in Ukraine. But it's, uh, again, in terms of being prepared, uh, it's, uh, and I think it's an issue which I think we're, we're all much more aware of now, and there's more support 
available for some of those nurses who were involved in those roles not that many years yeah. ago, just did not have the level of support exactly. that, they, uh, exactly. that, they, that they should have done. They should have done. Okay. Um, so let me say uh, a final huge, 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 huge thank you uh, to Janet and to Barbara and to Sophie, who I think you just mm -hmm. wonderfully brought to life international nursing in a, in a, in a way that I, probably, I wasn't quite expecting, but with the, with the voices, with the stories, and with, with, with the words, I think it's been, uh, I think it's been fantastic. Um, uh, so let's just show our appreciation.